Okay, so now we are in a very nice uh, situation. We have all these numerical methods we did so far. Uh, we also know about computer arithmetic, Kahan summation, random number generation, the Monte Carlo method, time discretization of SDEs. So we can simulate all kinds of models by just specifying new model parameters. And we can value all kinds of financial products by specifying new product implementations. So we have really now a nice toolbox, uh, nicely uh, separated in our object-oriented design, and we can play with this. And the first thing I would like to do here is to show you a variance reduction technique. So I have a small session here on variance reduction, so Monte Carlo variance reduction, and especially on Monte Carlo control variance. It's a very powerful yeah, and nice technique. I believe simple, easy to understand. And I like to illustrate you this also using a coding example where I will now use all these interfaces and classes we have created previously in the course. So what's the idea? So given a random variable X, well, maybe the value of a financial derivative or whatever, then you can define its Monte Carlo approximation. So I define this here by this E hat uh, expectation operator. And if we go back to our definition of the Monte Carlo, well, then this is given by averaging a sequence of IID random variables. Of course, later we just plug in, in the Monte Carlo method, we plug in a single event omega. So then the sequence of IID random variables becomes a sequence of random numbers. But maybe we move back to the original definition and view this now with a sequence of IID random variables xi having the same distribution as x. And also recall that we had convergence estimates, convergence rate, the true Monte Carlo convergence rate based on the Chebyshev inequality was order one divided by square root of n using quasi random number generators the cox malavka inequality, you saw that you can improve this by using low discrepancy sequences. So from that, you know that I would like to reduce the variance of this object because the variance determines the error, the approximation error. So how can I reduce the variance? Well, in some cases, I do not even need to do Monte Carlo. For example, if this is a European option on a quantity generated by a Black Schultz model, then I know an analytic formula for the expectation. So I can calculate it with Monte Carlo error zero. I have an analytic formula. Yeah, but my implementation is general. It allows many different general products and for many products, for example, like an Asian option, I do not have an analytic formula. But what if we have an analytic formula for another random variable? So now there's a random variable y, for which I do know the expectation analytically. Or I have a more very efficient method to get a highly accurate uh, um, estimate. Like for example, our Black Scholes model, where I have the Black Scholes formula, which involves the distribution function, but maybe I have a very accurate um, implementation of the distribution function. Then I can use this knowledge uh, to reduce the variance. So for that, the new random variable y, 
should be close to my target, random variable x, in a certain sense. So what I consider is now the iid sequence of the pairs xi and yi. So I also consider a Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation of y. Okay, so although I know the expectation of y analytically, I consider a sequence of iid random variables. So I consider the Monte Carlo approximation of y. And by comparing the analytic value and the Monte Carlo approximation of expectation of y, I have suddenly information about the Monte Carlo error. And if these two guys are closely related, then their two, their Monte Carlo error should also be closely related. Just think of the simple example where the two are identical. Yeah. So it means that I know the analytic solution of expectation of X because I know the analytic solution of expectation of Y and the two are identical. Then by comparing the Monte Carlo approximation of expectation of Y and the analytic solution, I know the Monte Carlo error of expectation of X. So this closely related between the two is the covariance. So if the covariance of the random variable X and random variable Y is high, then I can I have a good chance to reduce the Monte Carlo error of X. So to see this, Consider now the random variable z. And z is a function of a parameter c. So there is here a parameter c. And the random variable z is defined as the random variable x minus c times the random variable y minus its analytic expectation. What is the expectation of the random variable z? Yeah, expectation of z is just expectation of x. And now expectation is a linear operator, so I can move all the stuff here outside and split the expectation, it's expectation of y minus mu y. So, and this guy here is of course zero. So I have that the expectation of z is equal to the expectation of x. So calculating expectation of z is the same as calculating expectation of x, at least if you do not have an error. So, now consider the Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation of Z. So I consider a sequence of IID random variables set I, which is defined as my sequence of IID random variables XI minus C times YI minus mu Y. Yeah? So the Monte Carlo approximation of X and the Monte Carlo approximation of Y. So if you plug in the omega, then these are the random number sequences for the X and this is the random number sequence for the Y and this is the analytic expectation. If Y now has a Monte Carlo error, then you see what you do here is you have a Monte Carlo error on X and you subtract the Monte Carlo error that you see on Y with a given constant C. For C equals zero, Z is equal to X. So for C equals zero, I know that the Monte Carlo approximation error or the Monte Carlo variance of Z is the same as that of X. But now I can vary 
the parameter C. And I can try to minimize the Monte Carlo error by minimizing the variance. And you know that the variance will be better or the same because I already know for C equals zero, the two are the same. So that's the whole story about the control variate. I now try to find the C such that the random variable Z has minimum variance. So minimize the variance of Z as a function of this constant C. And then I calculate the expectation using Monte Carlo of Z, but I know that this is just the expectation of X. Yeah, what is the variance of Z? The variance of Z as a function of C. Okay, you just plug in X minus C times Y minus mu Y. So this is the variance of X minus two times covariance of X and Y times C plus C squared variance of Y. So this should be now minimized as a function of C. So I would like to find the C such that this has minimum variance. Just differentiate with respect to C. So you see D by DC, this gives me here a minus two times covariance XY. And here a plus two times C times variance of Y. This should be equal to zero. I divide by the variance of Y and I get that the optimal parameter C is now the covariance of X and Y divided by the variance of Y. The optimal C is different from zero if the covariance of X and Y is different from zero. So if the two random variables are related, then I have information about the Monte Carlo approximation error by looking at this difference here. If they are unrelated, I get C equals zero, which means that the Z is just the X and I cannot do anything better. So this um, additional part here, this is then called my control variate, or I also say that, uh, that Z is the controlled um, random variable. Yeah, and I use now Y or Y minus mu Y as a control. Okay, I like to calculate the expectation of X and I need to approximate it because I do not know the expectation of X analytically, but to improve the approximation, to reduce the error, I now have to calculate the covariance. So how can I expect that I know something about the covariance uh, when I even don't know something about the expectation? Yeah, now comes the funny thing. We can just approximate this here by a Monte Carlo approximation. So in general, the optimal C star is not known, but you may just approximate this covariance and also the variance if you don't know it by a Monte Carlo approximation. And this works really remarkably well. Let me show you a nice um, example and also maybe try to, to do some coding with this. Yeah, so maybe this example here is a little bit academic, yeah? but it's not so far from reality. What you often have is that you have a financial product or a function of which you would like to calculate the expectation, which is a little bit exotic, but which is close to something where you have an analytic formula. And what I consider is a European option under the Black Scholes model. But now my European option is here a little bit exotic. So I have the exotic payoff function. Um, I pay you not like 
a European call option maximum of S minus K and zero. But I pay you something which is similar to this. You get nothing if you are below some, oh, actually this should be here K1, yeah? There's a small typo, yeah? If you are below some K1. So the K1 is here. So that looks really like a plain option or you get S minus K if you are above uh, K2. So there's K2 here. So this part here looks like really a classical European call option. But in between, I have the slightly exotic option that I pay you S minus K1 squared. And in order to have the points connected divided by K2 minus K1. Okay, so you see there is some exotic payoff part in, in between, which deviates from what the real or the classic call option would pay you. So you see there is some deviation here. Yeah, uh, I do not have an analytic formula for this. Yeah? Maybe you could try to derive one, you know, splitting the integral, and then you have some quadratic terms. Maybe I'm lazy. I just do it with the Monte Carlo simulation. And of course, the idea for a control is quite obvious. What I will use as a control is just the classic call option. So I know that mu y is given by the Plexholz formula. So I have an analytic formula for something that is close. And now if you look at this picture and go back to the formulas, yeah, when you look at this stuff here and you use, for example, c equals to one, then you see what you are doing. You are looking at x minus y. Okay, x minus y. x minus y is actually this red area here. So this is the x minus y. Okay, so actually with a minus, yeah, so y minus x would be this red area here. And then you just say that the value of my option is the value of a Black Schulz option minus the value of this red area. So the control variant method is just valuing the difference. You see this on a pass by pass basis now, yeah? You are just subtracting all the values, yeah? Our model simulates a value for S. So our model simulates here a value for S and I just look at, look, okay, what's the difference between these two guys? And I take the difference of the random variables. So I'm always calculating these differences here. And the Monte Carlo approximation error depends on the variance of the random variable. So you see that the variance of the random variable is small because this area here, the area I'm integrating is just small. Okay, so my idea is to use as my control random variable y, which is the payoff function of a classic call option. And I use that to calculate or to control the random variable x. And my mu is given by the Black Scholes formula. So maybe for the time being, it's okay to just use c equals one and have a look what is happening. So let's have a small code session where we um, implement this. Uh, as always, if you like to play around, you find this here in our lecture repository. Yeah, and this has the name Monte Carlo control variant um, experiment. So let's, let's uh, 
Let's try this. So I create maybe here a new class where I would like to do this experiment. So we are now doing Monte Carlo and let's call this control variate. Okay, that's the package under which you will find this. And this is the Monte Carlo control variate experiment. Like to have a main method. Okay, and let's start. I like to value um, uh, an option under the Black Scholes model. So let's define some constant. So the initial value of my model. Uh, so maybe I take a one, yeah. It also be 100, whatever. Uh, let's take the risk free rate as 5%. This is the R parameter. Take the volatility as 20%. Then I like to do Monte Carlo, so have a time discretization. So this is a European option. So um, I just need a single time step. So this is a little bit wasting our framework, but let's keep it general. So number of time steps is uh, one. And um, yeah, the time step size should correspond to the option maturity. Um, let's have option maturity five. So the time step size is uh, five, yeah, five years. Yeah, speaking of the financial product that has a maturity of uh, five, um, then I have two strikes. So I have K1 and K2, so define the two strikes. So the first strike is maybe initial value of the stock is one. No, so maybe let's take one at the first strike and take um, the second strike a little bit higher, 1.6. Yeah? So we have a larger area uh, where this thing is having this quadratic, quadratic shape here. Yeah, maybe to make it nicer. Yeah, my time discretization depends on the option maturity, just one time step until the option maturity. So that's how it looks. And let's do a Monte Carlo simulation. So the number of sample paths with 10 million. And I also need a seat. Yeah, let's use my favorite seed 3.41. So now I use my building blocks, the model. So the model is a Black Scholes model. So I specify that I would like to use a Black Scholes model. So let's create um, a Black Scholes model specification. You sometimes have to be a little bit careful here because the Black Schultz model exists in different numerical contexts, the Fourier method and the Monte Carlo method. I need the implementation that is related to the Monte Carlo method. So then I need the Brown in motion. So for that, I also need my time discretization. Time discretization. So there's a time discretization constructor that allows the initial value, number of time steps and the Delta T. That's maybe exactly the guy which I would like to have. Then I need my Brown in motion. So I, I always do this nice completion here. So there's a Brown in motion constructor that takes, uh, so that's the Brown in bridge. I would like to have the Brown in motion. Uh, say from random number generator or from MSN. So just use that guy that already specifies the MSN twister. So I do not have to specify the random number generator separately. So time discretization, number of factors is actually one number of simulation paths I have specified and the seat. Okay, it's a 
one factor model. There's just one DW. So then specify the numerical scheme. So my Euler scheme, oh, maybe I let him import this here. So my Euler scheme is now my Monte Carlo process. Um, this is my Euler scheme. So my Euler scheme from POSEF model, the one that uses the model, Black Schultz model, and the stochastic driver, the Brown in motion. So that's the Black Schultz model and Brown in motion. Okay, um, I wrap this up in, in this simulation, which gives me then the numeraire and the value of the stock under yeah, a nice name. So this is the Monte Carlo asset model. So this is my Black Scholes Monte Carlo simulation model. Okay, so this is just my wrapper around this process that will create the nice name. So now I have all the stuff here. Yeah? So I can ask here, give me the value of the stock at a given time, no? or also given time index, and give me the value of the numeraire. So we can start valuing the financial product. Uh, I do not write a separate financial product valuation code here. I write everything here uh, now uh, straight also because the control variance depends on that we know the model that was used. Yeah, We have here a very specific um, knowledge. That's a disadvantage. Our control depends on these parameters of the Black Scholes model. So this is now my product. My product and my control variant. So what do we need? I need the S of T, yeah? So my payoff function needs the S of T. I need my underlying and I would like to create then these two quantities, this guy, this random variable and this random variable. So I also need the two uh, numerias. So let's create the underlines. So this is a random variable. Um, this is my underlying yeah, or the underlying at maturity. So I ask my simulation give me the value at the option maturity. So this is my S of T. So he likes to throw some exception. Yeah, maybe just don't let him complain. So I also need the numeraire. So maybe I just fetch all these random variables, which I need. So this is the numeraire at payment time. So I ask for the numeraire at maturity. Uh, I also need the numeraire in little t. So this is the next guy which I need. So at evaluation time, so get numeraire at initial time. And now I can calculate the random variable V of T for the classic option. Yeah. So I would like to calculate now the right-hand side. So let's call this here the payoff of a plain European option. So let's call it payoff plain. So the payoff plane is S minus K. 
So this is the underlying minus the K. Actually, it's now the K1. Maximum of that and zero. So the floor guy here is doing the maximum of X and zero. Okay, that's actually the function which I would like to have. Okay, so that's this part here with the K1. So that's my plane underlying. Uh, let's calculate now the V of T. The V of T is now this complicated function. So you see the V of T actually agrees with the plane one. If we are larger than K2. Okay, so I have to choose um, whether I'm larger, at, uh, uh, whether I'm larger as K2, or whether I'm smaller as K2. So this is my, say, payoff exotic. And the payoff exotic now depends whether I'm larger as K2 or smaller as K2. So let's just calculate first this. So underlying minus strike two, floor zero. So whether I'm larger as this or smaller I'm this, I have to choose between this value if I'm larger or other stuff if I'm smaller. And you know, I'm working here on random variables. Yeah, all these guys are random variables. So if you make a dot here, you see that you have all these operations on random variables. And there's also an operation on random variables that is called choose. And it has here two arguments. So the value, if the trigger is non-negative, so he will use this value if this guy here is positive, or he will use that value if this guy is negative. So this is just like an indicator function or combination of two indicator functions that chooses depending on this indicator here. And this is exactly what I want. So the choice is if this here is positive, my option value is the same as the one of the plane. So I can already provide here the first argument. Okay, so in this choose, I just have now to specify here the second part. And you see the second part is just this, the plane one, S minus K1 squared, actually also maximum of S minus K1 squared, divided by that. So I can just here write, this is the pay of plane squared. Oh, nice. The random variables also provide just the squared. And then I have to divide by K2 minus K1. That's it. So that's, you can maybe check it, the payoff V of capital T. So this here is the maximum S of T minus K1 and zero. And this here is my complicated V of capital T, yeah, which is, based on this trigger here, either the same as the European option or this slightly squared shape. Yeah, so there is a, a small choice here. Yeah, also this zero here is already captured inside, inside there because I'm taking the square of maximum of S of T minus K one and zero. So it will just continue like that, yeah? So here this payoff plane will be zero if you are below K1, then it's okay. I'm just dividing zero by this, this stuff here. So now I have all the things and we can calculate the values. So this is the value of the plane option. So the value of the plane option is now the expectation of this random variable uh, uh, 
Yeah, so maybe I just calculate this random variable. So this is my payoff multiplied with the numeraire at, or I'll say divided by the numeraire at payment and of capital T multiplied with the numeraire at evaluation. And this guy is my random variable Y. This is my control. And my value exotic. So this is my exotic option. This is my random variable X. It's the same, the payoff exotic divided by the numeraire at payment. Yeah? So now I have calculated the random variable Y and the random variable X. So we can maybe print these values and just check how the values are. So how do I call, call this? Yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe I just just call it in the in the print. So I do some printout. So what I have is I have the plain product using Monte Carlo. Okay, so this is the value of the plain random variable. Okay, from that, I need to get the expectation, the average. And maybe I also like to plot the standard error of this random variable. So that's maybe nice. So let's also plot the standard error of this random variable. So let's have a tabulator and maybe then a nice Unicode symbol. This is, I don't know, is this right? This should be the plus plus minus. I don't know, I have to check. Uh, and let's plot the, plot the standard error. Uh, so this is a random variable object and my random variable object, they all provide such handy things like also a standard standard error. So I can just print the standard error of this random variable. And this is the exotic product. The exotic product using Monte Carlo, it's the same stuff for the random variable exotic. <clears throat> Let's see if this is correct. Let's run this. Okay, so something is wrong because the two guys are the same and they should be different. What did I do wrong? Uh, yeah, okay, so I did a, I did a stupid mis mistake, yeah? So the choice here, of course, is uh, not based on maximum of S minus K2, it's based on S minus K2, yeah? because here he would always choose the first argument, yeah? Okay, that guy has to go away. That was a stupid mistake. So let's let's run, uh, run it again. Okay, so you see, I get the value of the two options, the classical call option and my exotic one with the little squared you know, um, uh, area in the payoff. And the two are quite similar. Yeah, So it's an 0.29 and an 0.26. Yeah, They are quite similar. And they have an error at 10 to the minus uh, four. So now let's do the control variant uh, method. So um, let's also calculate the analytic value because for my control, I need the analytic value. So this is my mu subscript y. So this is now the value analytic. So this is just take an analytic formula, just take the black shoals option value. So this is the initial value, the risk-free rate, the volatility, the option maturity and the strike, but it's the strike one, right? Okay, this is the analytic value. So let's print this.
So this is the analytic value. Of course, the error here is just zero. Okay, so you see, I have estimated an error 10 to the minus four, and yeah, the analytic value deviates here at the fourth digit from my Monte Carlo. So that's a reasonable thing for the Monte Carlo error. And now let's do the control value. So let's first define C to equal to, to be one. Yeah. So I do not do the optimization. So the controlled value is also a random variable. So this is now the value controlled. Okay, so what's that? So I use now my control variant. My control variant is x minus c times y minus mu y. So that's my exotic value minus c times the plain value this is a random variable minus the analytic value. Yeah, and this is then multiplied with C. So this is the controlled value. This is now my variance, hopefully variance reduced variable. And let's consider this guy. So this is the exotic pro uh, product using controlled Monte Carlo. So maybe I make that a bit nicer and I print the value controlled and also the standard error for this controlled value. Okay, and you see, I have a different value, but I have a big improvement here, yeah? a factor of 10 in my Monte Carlo error. Yeah? So you can now say that this guy is maybe accurate here in this digit yeah? before it was not. Okay, so you can also use the optimal C. What was the optimal C? The optimal C is the covariance of X and Y. Yeah. So this covariance is take the value of the y, so this is here the value plane, minus its expectation, yeah, because I would like to calculate the covariance, minus the expectation. So this is the value, sorry, the value plane, the expectation. So, And then I multiply this random variable with the same expression for the exotic guy. So the y, y minus expectation of y. This thing here is the covariance. Okay, divided by the variance of y, divided by the variance of the plane. So value plane and there's a nice function for get variance. Okay, so let's try now with this optimal, hopefully optimal C. Uh, and I get a 1.38. So that is slightly better as the 1.39. Okay, so clearly from the picture, we would already guess that C equals one is maybe the optimal guy. So to, to finish my, my session on control variates, yeah, that is maybe a nice example. You can play a little bit with this here in our code repository. Just let me shortly state that you can generalize this to multiple controls. So if you have multiple random variables for which you know the analytic solutions, yeah. then you can define, ah, so here is a small typo. So this is a mu y k. So then you can of course also define the control using these multiple 
controls here with individual coefficient CK. For CK equals zero, Z and X are the same random variables. Expectation for of Z and expectation of X is the same yeah, because I'm subtracting here the expectation. So I can use now the coefficient CK to minimize the variance. And if you have the additional assumption that your controls, your random variables Y are already orthogonal, otherwise you can create an orthogonalization first. If they are already orthogonal, then the, co the variance of the random variable Z is really a nice uh, function yeah, because the variance of these independent uh, controls is just the sum of the variances. Another typo maybe, yeah, depending how you see the sum. Yeah, maybe you have here this, the sum again. Okay, and now you just like to minimize minimize this. Yeah? Differentiating with respect to CK gives the same equation for each CK. Yeah? So I just get the optimal CK parameter, which is the covariance between X and your control YK divided by the variance YK. So you can also generalize this to if you have knowledge that there are multiple random variables which are close to your uh, random variable X of interest. Yeah. Very easy, very nice formula if the Y's are already autogonal. So that was it for today. <laughs>